You're now tuned in to Utopian Turtle Top Productions. This is the State of Things. I'm Frank Stacio. A lot of academic research was paid for with public funding, but public access is often restricted by expensive paywalls. Meanwhile, some academic publishing companies have higher profit margins than companies like Walmart, Google, and Apple. But there is a movement underway that could turn the tide. Universities are about educating humans, and there is literally no reason to keep information from people. There, there is nothing gained other than money and power and things that, as people, we should want to push up against. A lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money. It's huge, huge business, billions of dollars of business. Academic publishing is a $25.2 billion a year industry. This journal by Elsevier, Biomaterials, costs an average $10,702 for yearly digital subscriptions. Is that money well spent? It's hard to say. In 1995, Forbes magazine predicted that scholarly research would be the internet's first victim. Academics were progressive and surely journals would lose power and revenue with digital distribution. 23 years later, this couldn't be further from the truth. I think one thing we learn when we look at history is that humans are really bad at predicting the future. And this is something that the media, they love to do, and people who consume media love to read it. It's fun. It we are sorry. You don't have the credentials to access this documentary. Please see payment options below. The scholarly publishing industry makes about a 35 to 40 percent profit margin. But in different years when I've looked at this, you know, Walmart's making around 3 percent. And Walmart is like this evil, you know, giant for a lot of people. But it's 3 percent compared to 35 percent. I mean, I could have flipped my own attitudes now. Like, Walmart's not that bad compared to some of these other players in other industries. You know, wealth management industry is around 21 percent. Toyota's around 12 percent. How is it okay? for this whole industry to be making so much a profit margin when there really aren't any inputs that they have to pay for. What other corporations would you compare with that sort of profit margin of that 32, 35? I've honestly never heard of, of corporations that have profit margins that are that big. In most other lines of, lines of normal enterprise and business, that kind of profit margin is, is the sign of some kind of monopoly logic at work. Even though people not in academia may not be reading a lot of these articles, may not find them useful, they are still paying for them. Your tax dollars go towards governments who then subsidize universities, who then provide funds to libraries, who pay publishers through subscription fees. The journals and the publishers are getting uh, your money. Whether it's you or your neighbor, everyone's paying into the system, and the people benefiting the most are, are publishers. Everybody deserves a profit margin, but how can journals, journals, have a profit margin larger than some of the biggest tech companies? Well, publishing is so profitable because the workers don't get paid. I mean, what other industry, I can think of none, in which the primary workers, in this case the authors and reviewers, get paid nothing. Profit margins in many respects in the publishing industry are second to none. And a few years back, I compared them to Facebook, and I realized they're about the equivalent of the most successful software companies today in terms of margins. And of course, Facebook has virtually infinite scale, and there's arguably no more successful company in the last five or ten years. So um, publishing is obscenely profitable, and uh, because of it, uh, the, the publisher is in no rush to see the world change. See, there is a real question as to why the margins are so high. Like 35% is higher than Google's margins. What's going on there? Well, that, that is you know, simply because the pricing power. You know, if you are Elsevier, let's say, you have proprietary access. You, you know, you're selling a stream of content into a university. And it's not like you know, going to the supermarket and if the, you know, one beer is too expensive, you choose another one. You know, you, it's not like a university librarian can say, well, the Elsevier papers are too expensive, we'll just go with Wiley this year. You know, you kind of need all of them. 
Uh, and so you, you have uh, ability to charge really as much as you want, and the universities will rarely actually balk. They might pretend to balk, but the reality is their faculty have to have access, and that's a very powerful position for the businesses. Here, here's a problem in the market. Uh, the market exhibits what what uh, sometimes called a moral hazard, which doesn't really have anything to do with morality, but an economic term. So uh, moral hazard comes about when the purchasers of a good are not the consumers of the good. So what is the good here in the traditional publishing market? It's access, you know, re readership access. The consumers are people like me who want to read the articles. The purchasers, though, are not me. I don't tend to subscribe to journals. The Harvard Library spends huge amounts of money subscribing to a huge range of, of journals. So I'm price insensitive to these journals because uh, I don't have to pay the bill. The, the money is real, right? Academic publishing for journals is a $10 billion a year revenue producing industry. This is not chump change. This is a significant amount of money. When you think about a profit margin of 30 to 40 percent, taken out of that, that could be put back into the research enterprise, whether it's supporting more science, whether it's supporting universities, you know, hiring more researchers, paying more faculty, making college more affordable, that uh, 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 financial aspect is a symptom of just how out of alignment this commercial model is in trying to, to, to stay relevant in the research process. Usually we don't think about uh, the relationship between the profit of such companies on the one hand and the ever increasing uh, tuition fees at universities. But it's also part of the story. We are not talking about a marginal problem. We are not talking about the internal issues of the scholars. We are talking about very basic social problems. What will be the future of our societies? Journal prices have been increasing way above the level of inflation and well above the rate at the, of the growth of library budgets uh, for not just for years, but for decades. And it's been uh, a catastrophe. Just hours ago, Anthem College shut down. St. Joseph's College will be closing its doors. I went deep in debt. Dowling College is shutting its doors. The abrupt closure leaves faculty without jobs and thousands of students scrambling to find another school. The academy writ large has not really a examine the full cost of scholarly communication. It's been really the library's budgets that have borne the brunt of that, and we've often had to go hat in hand to the administration to get increases for serial, specifically science, technology, medicine journals that have just um, had a rapid increase in price for whatever reasons the publishers may claim for that. And for profit to go up, scarcity has to prevail. Welcome to the world of paywalls blocking research. Have you hit paywalls? Absolutely. I definitely hit a paywall. I hit a paywall frequently. Have you ever hit a paywall? Oh, yes. I hit a paywall. Quite often I'll find a paywall, yes. When I was a student, I definitely hit a paywall. I hit paywalls a lot. How do you feel? I feel really pissed. Students graduate, get their masters, uh, flow into those spin-off companies and suddenly they discovered that they could not get access to the research results that they needed because they were no longer affiliated with the university. They came knocking on my door and uh, I had to tell them that as a librarian I was in this awkward position that I had to block non-affiliated users for access to publicly funded research. And that is completely contrary to the mission of a library and a librarian. So that was an eye-opener. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Dwight Parker. Um, in the middle of my uh, working on a PhD in ed psychology, I decided to t I needed to take a break from that. And I'm selling cars. While I was in the program, I had access to lots of things, but um, it, it, once you're outside that program, if you those same resources just aren't available to you, at least they weren't you know, to me anyway. In, in you know, the education psychology was mine, and most of the research done is government funded, so that's taxpayer money going to fund research that they're then charging for, which is absurd. I mean, it's absurd. Absolutely. 
not to mention it's a public good. I mean, certain you know, academic research, and that I, I, I need to be able to access that research regardless. And I mean, I don't have seventy nine ninety nine or yeah. to do that. Not selling cars, even the coolest car in existence. If I worked for Elsevier, I could afford it. <laughs> yeah, or any one of those. I mean, you know, it's such a anyway. You know, you guys are doing it. You know, it's it's so it, the the money just corrupts everything. You know, it's it's the, you get the money, you get the government, and everybody's all, and it's like the the science gets lost. Honestly, it gets lost. My wife uh, had a pulmonary embolism, and they're not sure why, and nobody is still sure why she had a pulmonary embolism. It could be a number of different things, and so I started doing the thing I do, which is get on the internet, start doing research, and you hit all these medical research paywalls where people are doing these studies about PE, and I can't afford to spend the money to read a research paper only to discover that it's not relevant to her, to relevant to our situation. It might be, it might not be, but there's not enough information in front of it for me to tell. But it could save her life. The, the reason that we have research is we're trying to solve problems in the world. We're trying to cure diseases. We're trying to figure out clean water. We're trying to figure out how to take poverty to zero. Uh, we're trying to completely wipe out uh, particular disease states once and for all. Um, and if you want to do that, we've got to make sure that everybody has access. Not just rich countries, not just people who have PhDs, but Everybody gets to read scientific research, think about it, and then contribute their ideas. And when large portions of the population don't have access to research, the odds of us solving big problems are significantly lower. The publishers have been part of curating the scholarly dialogue for centuries, and in that respect, they are vital. At the same time, we have a global population that the vast majority does not have access to research about current developments in science, medicine, culture, technology, um, environmental science, and are faced with the prospect of trying to make sense of the world without access to the best knowledge about it. And in some sense, that is tragic. Western universities are really great funds for their libraries. So they, are in the, they have the capacity to I mean, purchase the journals, give access to their students. But uh, in context of developing countries, uh, libraries are really poor. So you eventually end up doing everything on your own without any support from the university or college. And even if when you're trying to approach your faculties, your professors, you get the same answers that uh, we did it the same way and you'll have to do it the same way as well. So it just keeps going and we don't get a concrete result out of it. So my research was more in very fundamental physics, uh, special relativity there. And, um, and many of these papers, again, was, uh, you have to pay for them. Um, I will say I will never, I never pay it for, for any paper, especially in the economy of uh, Venezuela. Right now it's even worse, unfortunately. But even when I was a student there, uh, you just kind of take your credit card and buy something from the internet. <laughs> so from the lack of access, a movement has sprung out, and that movement is called open access. In its simplest form, open access is you know, free and unencumbered access to um, information. It very simply is a way to democratize information. It's to reduce disparity and promote equality. There's lots of academics out there who can build on top of the research that's gone before if they have access to all of the research. You might have some of the greatest minds of our generation living out in Central African Republic who don't have access to any of the content. So what can they build on top of that's, you know, what can they, how can they help move things further, faster? And I think that is what open access is all about. It's, it's allowing people who want access to the knowledge to have access to the knowledge and take it further. I, I think being passionate about open access is, is great. Um, where I get concerned is when a, somebody's passion for open access leads them to be unwilling to think about the costs of it as well as the benefits of it. I, I, I get concerned when open access becomes a religion or when it becomes a halo that, that, that requires you to love whatever it's placed over. Um, if, we, if we lose our ability or, or worse, our willingness to think critically to think as critically and analytically about an open access model as we do about a toll access model, 
then we are no longer operating in the realm of reason and science. We're now operating in the realm of religion. Uh, and and I've got, I, I, I'm a religious person myself. I've got nothing against religion, but, but it's important not to confuse it with science. I can see how, especially if you're on the other side, it would appear religious. There's a lot of belief, for sure, right? It's a belief-based It's a belief -based movement for a lot of people. But a lot of the most powerful pieces of the movement come from the biomedical literature, from parents who can't access it, right? From family members who can't access it. And, and those take on an element of witness and testimony that is religious, at least in overtone, right? And there's, there's real power in witness and testimony. That's why they're part of evangelical movements. And you know, we can have a, a nerdy conversation about innovation, or I can give you an emotional story. Which one goes more viral? And movements need to take all kinds, right? Movements are bigger than organizations. They're bigger than people when they work, right? That's kind of why they work. They take on this rolling avalanche aspect. For me, why I'm doing this is, uh because of the benefits to research efficiency. I want to see increased research efficiency overall. That's, that's my overall goal. If you said closed science was the way to do that, I would be supporting closed science. But that research efficiency comes with increases in quality, increases in inclusivity, increases in diversity, increases in uh, innovation. Just having more people that can do something is, is a benefit. We have big problems to solve. I was very much involved, deeply involved, in the early days of open access in life sciences. And the, our hope was that open access will not only bring the very significant change in access, it seemed completely crazy that most of research is not available to most of the people who need it. I had a visit to the University of Belgrade a few years ago and I was meeting with grad students before my lecture uh, and we were w going around the room talking about what each researcher did uh, for their, we were working on for their thesis. And almost everyone in the room was working on uh, implicit cognition. And it was amazing that there were so many students working on this particular area of research. And so I said, why are all of you doing this? Like, what, how has it become this, this be the area that's so popular? And the immediate response was, well, we can access the literature in this area. What? What do you mean? And I say, well, it, there's a norm of all the leading researchers in your field, all of you put your papers online so we can find them and we can know what's going on right now in this literature uh, that we can't get access to in other sub-disciplines. I was blown away by that, right? That they, that they made some decisions about what to study based on what they could access. When I was directing the library, and we had made major cuts in our subscriptions because of budgetary constraints, same sort of thing that, that libraries do. And we did a series of focus groups to try to see how people were coping with that. And one of the people who really stood out to me was a young MD, PhD student. And he had talked with his advisor and his advisor had said, well, these are, these are interesting areas. Read widely in these areas. And he said, so I have to read widely. But I realize my ability to read widely is constrained by what you have access to. And so my dissertation topic is going to be constrained by what you are able to afford because I can't get at and read this other material that you no longer have access to. Some of the world's greatest challenges are not going to be solved by one individual group of researchers. And we know that interdisciplinary research and collaboration is the way to get to those solutions faster. And because so many of those challenges are so prevalent, clean water, food security, global warming, there's public health, there's so many challenges that need to be solved that there's no reason why we wouldn't want to do everything we can to drive that collaboration and to enable it to happen. Medical knowledge and incredible expertise can be found in every far corner of the world. We just haven't tapped into it too often. So um, uh, a friend of mine, is a uh, pediatric heart surgeon at Stanford. He w observed when he was visiting in India 
and went to an institution that has now treated 10 times as many patients as him. And they're able to get almost as good results as he gets in Stanford. And they can do this between 5 and 10% the cost. And to me, that's genius. That is genius. And you would think that we in the Western world would want to understand what's going on in India as much as they would want to see what we're able to do with all our marvels of technology. It's an easy conclusion to draw that scholarship must be open uh, in order for scholarship to happen. And so it's sort of a curiosity that it isn't already open. But that's really because of the history of how we got here. Ever since the scholarly journal was uh, founded or created in the mid-17th century, authors have written for them without pay, and they've written for impact, not for money. To better understand the research process, we traveled to where research journals originated, the Royal Society of London. I'm Stuart Taylor. I'm the publishing director here at the Royal Society. The Royal Society is Britain's National Academy of Science. It was founded in 1660 as a society of the early scientists such as Robert Hooke and Christopher Wren. A few years after that, in 1665, Henry Oldenburg here, who was the first secretary of the society, launched the world's first science journal called Philosophical Transactions. And that was the first time that the uh, scientific achievements and discoveries of early scientists was uh, formally recorded. And that journal has essentially set the model for what we now know today of science journals, embodying the four principles of archival, registration, dissemination, and verification. So that means having your discovery associated with your name and a particular date, having it verified by review by your peers, um, having it disseminated to other scientists, and also having it archived for the future. As soon as there were digital networks, scholars began sharing scholarship on them. Ever since, uh, let's say, the early 90s, uh, academics have been uh, seriously promoting open access, not just using the network to distribute scholarship and research, but promoting it and trying to uh, foster it for others. It may sound like I'm making this up, but I really felt at the time, and I was not alone, that if you have some uh, wonderful idea or you make some breakthrough, you like to think it's because you had some inspiration, or uh, you worked harder <laughs> than anyone else, but you don't like to think it was because you had privileged access to information. And so, you know, part of my intent in 1991 was just to level the playing field, that is, give everybody access to the same information at the same time and not have these, you know, disparities in access. 40% of all the papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the New England Journal of Medicine is arguably the most impactful journal in the world, but 40% of the authors came from a 150-mile radius of Boston, which is where the New England Journal of Medicine is headquartered. Publishing is really an insider's game. Those of us who are insiders have much greater access to publishing and also even reading because we come from the richer institutions. There are a lot of people who are suffering as a result of the current system in academia. There are a lot of doctors who would benefit from having the latest information about uh, what the best care to give to the patients. There is so much research that has been done already. It's ridiculous sometimes when you try to access a paper that was written in 1975 and it's still behind a paywall. It doesn't make any sense. Research journals have come a long way since 1665. We now have the ability to reach many around the globe simultaneously for next to nothing, and that is a huge benefit for scholars. Many authors think that if they publish in a conventional journal, especially an important conventional journal, a high prestige, a high impact, high quality conventional journal, they're reaching everybody who cares about their work. Uh, that's false. Uh, they're reaching everybody who is lucky enough to work at an institution that's wealthy enough to subscribe to that journal. And even if those journals are relative bestsellers or if they're must-have journals that all libraries uh, try to subscribe to, there are still libraries that cannot subscribe to them. Uh, many libraries have long since canceled their must-have journals just because they don't have the money. So uh, authors get the benefit of a wider audience. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
And by getting a wider audience, they get the benefit of greater impact because you can't have impact in your work. Your work cannot be built upon or cited or taken up or used uh, unless people know what it is. And most scholars write for impact. Part of what academics do is study questions, try to figure out some insight about what they've learned about a phenomenon and then share that with others so that those others can then say, oh, what about this? What about that? Are you sure? Or, oh yeah, let me use this in some new way. So really, scholarship is a conversation. And the only way to have a conversation uh, is to know what each other is saying and what the basis is for what they're saying. And so you, openness is fundamental to scholarship doing what it's supposed to do. It's one of those original myths about open access. So there's no peer review, there's lower quality, and so forth. And we know that when you put your stuff out in the open, people notice if you, you know, if you BS your way out there, you'll be caught very quickly. If you miss something important in terms of a piece of evidence, someone will, will, will point you to it. If you are not careful with your argument, if you miss a piece of important literature, someone will tell you that. And so you as a researcher would benefit from these, from these observations and criticisms and, and other things. So your research would be better. Uh, uh, not lower quality as a result of it. If you don't work in this space, you don't have any context, you don't have any concept of the sort of dramatic impact that, that these tensions are going to have on everyone. You know, when you see the EPA take down its climate change section of its website, um, there's, there's real concrete impacts to not having information be available. There, there's plenty of free information out there and we all know how problematic it can be just because it's free doesn't make it good, just because it's paid for doesn't make it bad. And I think that's the tension that um, this community is always going to have to deal with. Of course, in the very early days of the uh, open access movement and open access journals, this notion that uh, open access publishing is uh, not of high quality was very predominant, but that has changed now. Open access to us does not at all um, denigrate the level of peer review. You know, if anything, you know, it's going to be even, even better. The reward system in many countries, in many developing countries, still mirrors our own in the UK and the US. We did a, a survey recently asking about our researchers' perceptions of open access, and lots of them, you know, were saying, great, open access is exactly what we need. We need to tell the whole world about our research. Everyone needs access. This is great. Um, however, when we asked the researchers what their priorities were for journals, where they wanted to publish their journals, the top things were impact factor, indexing, and at the bottom of the list was open access. So whilst they were saying great things about open access, it's unfortunately because of the reward structures, it's n nearer the bottom because they still need to progress their career. Open access has been with us for some time. The impact has not been as quick as I expected. And I'm kind of I'm kind of worried that in the next five years, how fast are we going to move? Oh, is there a reason that you know that research journals are so lethargic to change? Well, you might call them resilient. <laughs> that's, that's a better word. Um, uh, I think there is a certain degree of lethargy. Um, as you know, academics are probably the most conservative people on the planet. You know, yes, they may be innovating with their research, but academic structures are very slow to change. The academic community is very, very conservative. It's very hard to change, make significant system changes in the academic community. Our process for tenure now is the same as it was 150 years ago. Authors are very aware that their chances of progress, their continuing in jobs, getting fundings, whole aspect of their careers depend on where they publish. And this uh, need created a sort of prison in which authors cannot have an alternative way to publish except to publish in those journals that are most likely to help them in their careers. One of the big obstacles for open access is actually the current research assessment and tenure and all these things. Uh, because there still is a tendency to, to say, okay, if you publish four papers in sort of the higher ranked journals, 
you are producing better research. It might be so that those papers uh, will never be cited or never read, but they take uh, the journal impact factor as a proxy for quality. And we know, all of us, that it is subject to gaming and fraud. The impact factor is actually the average number of citations that that journal um, gets over, um, it's a two-year uh, window. The impact factor is a perverse uh, metric which has somehow become entrenched in the evaluation system and the way researchers are assessed uh, across the world. You can charge uh, for a Gucci handbag a hell of a lot more than you can for one that you just pick off the high street. Impact factors have, have perverted the, the whole system of scholarly communications massively. And even their founder, uh, Eugene Garfield, said they should not be used in this way. Then you've, you must begin to wonder that you know, there's something, something wrong. And the faux scientific nature of them, you know, the fact that they're accurate to three decimal places where they're, they're clearly not, and, you know, giving this, um, this, this, this um, pseudo-scientific feel to them. The Royal Society a few years ago signed something called the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, or DORA for short, which essentially calls on uh, institutions and funders to assess scientists in ways that don't use the impact factor. So going much more back to peer review and actually looking at the work itself rather than simply re re relying on a metric which many people believe to be a, a very flawed metric. But the way of addressing the problem is to start divorcing the assessment of an academic from the journals in which they're publishing. And if you're able to evaluate an academic based on the research that they produced on their own rather than where that research has been published, I think you can then start to allow researchers to publish in you know, journals that provide better service, better access, lower cost, all of these things. Journals that are highly selective reject work that is perfectly uh, publishable and perfectly um, good, but they reject it because it's not a significant advance, it's not going to make the headlines in the same way as a, uh, a paper on disease or stem cells might. So it gets rejected and then goes to another journal, goes through another round of peer review, um, and you can go through this through several cycles. And in fact, the rationale for launching PLOS One was exactly uh, to try and, and stop that rounds and rounds of, of wasted both uh, scientist time, reviewers time, um, uh, editors time and ultimately you know at the expense of, of science and society. The time it takes to go through the top tier journals um, and to maybe not make it and then have to go to another journal locks up that, that particular bit of research in a time warp. It is in the interest of research funders who are paying you know, millions or billions of dollars to fund research every year for that research to then be openly available. There have been a lot of different ways to come at this and a lot of people have said, let's be incremental. First, we'll create what's called green open access where you'll just provide access to the content but no usage rights that are associated with that. The Gates Foundation said, that's only half a loaf. We're not in the half a loaf business. If, if you're gonna do this, go all the way. Um, and I really applaud them for not wanting to take the middle step. They have enough foresight and, frankly, uh, leverage to demand getting it right the first time around. From the Foundation's perspective, we're able to, through our funding, work with our grantees to say, yes, we're going to give you this money, and yes, we want you to do certain you know, scientific and technical research and yield a particular outcome, but we want you to do it in a particular way. And one of the ways that we want people to work is to ensure that the results of what they do is broadly open and accessible. And along with that, we want to ensure that um, not only the money that we spend directly are on our you know, investments in new science and technology yield a tangible benefit to those people, but we'd also like to see it have a multiplier effect so that you know, the information, the results of, of what we fund in gets out for broader use by the scientific community, the academic community to, to build on and to, to sort of accelerate and expand the results that we're achieving. What comes to mind when you hear of Elsevier? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, yes, Elsevier is a, is a pain in the neck for us in Africa because uh, their prices are too high for us. They don't want to come down. You know, I think we can say that Elsevier 
is a Elsevier is actually a good contributor to the publishing community. Elsevier, what comes to mind? Well, I, I'm a level of profit that I I I, I, I think is unfortunately unpalatable and in, unsupportable because when from a university's point of view, of course, it's all public funds. There. Um, licensing practices which have certainly evolved over time. You know, if we look at Elsevier's um, reuse or, or commercial practices over the past 10 years, I think they've uh, made a lot of changes that have made themselves more author or researcher friendly. So it, it, there, there's definitely an, an evolution there. This publisher, so whenever we publish something there, so this uh, is financed by our departments. This is kind of public money. So we are paying the money, but they are closing it. I would never characterize them as a bad actor. Um, I think they do a lot of good for supporting innovation and kind of cross-industry initiatives. There's a lot of reasons why um, people focus on Elsevier as kind of the bad guy. Have a look at their annual report, it's all online, their profits are up, their dividends are up, they're doing very well. Uh, they made a couple of billion pounds in profit last year. By and large, um, does our industry um, treat researchers well? Do we um, act effectively as a responsible midwife for these important uh, scholarly concepts or ideas um, and make them accessible to the world and distribute them um, or, and reinvest in the community? I, I would say yes. I personally think that Elsevier has, um, you know, comes in for a lot of bad press. Some of it is deserved and earned, I think. I also think they have made a lot of smart innovations in publishing that we have all learned from. I remember when I moved to UC Press, I had moved from 20 years in commercial publishing into the nonprofit university press world. And it turned out that one of the um, main concerns that some of the staff had was that I was going to turn UC Press into Elsevier, <laughs> um, which of course has not happened. Um, but I, I, well, seriously, I think that those of us in the sort of nonprofit publishing world can actually learn a lot from big competitors. I worked for Elsevier for a year, so I have to say, you know, disclaimer. Um, I also worked for 15 years for uh, nonprofit scholarly societies, and I was a journal publisher in, uh, in both of those environments. They're different environments, and for me, my view of commercial publishers was shaped by my experience coming out of a scholarly society. I worked for the American Astronomical Society, where our core mission was to get the science into the hands of the scientists when they wanted it, the way they wanted it. I went to uh, a commercial publisher. Uh, I was recruited by them. I thought I was going to do more of the same. But that was really not the job. The job was managing a set of journals to a specific profit margin. And that just wasn't my cup of tea. It didn't mesh with the values that I have. So I went back into not-for-profit publishing. I do think it's, it, they're not, it, it's not that they're bad entities, but their, their goal is to return profits to their shareholders. They're not mission-driven organizations, and that's fine. They're commercial companies. Yeah. My question is, right now in the 21st century, when we have these other mechanisms that can enable the flow of science, are they helping or hurting? And I would like to see them adjust their models to be a little bit more helpful rather than harmful. There, there are absolutely just criticisms that can be leveled at Elsevier. There are just criticisms that can be leveled at PLOS. There are just criticisms that can be leveled at anyone and anything. Um, I don't, I, I try not to judge the legitimacy of a criticism based on its target. I try to judge the legitimacy of a criticism based on its content. <laughs> oh yeah, good, I just wanted to make sure someone said this. You know, um, when you talk about what kind of company Elsevier is, the hostility that they, um, they sometimes get it's not just about the money, it's about the kind of company they are, right? It's the actions they take are often, they're anti-collegiate. So when they sent takedown notices to academia.edu, where academics had put, put up some uh, PDFs of their research and they were forced to take them down. Obviously the lawsuit against Sci-Hub as well in 2015. And yes, both of those things were illegal, but the academic community doesn't yeah, it doesn't really see them in that way. When I got the takedown notice, I didn't get the takedown notice directly from Elsevier. They sent it to an official at Princeton. In the notice itself, it only mentions a handful of papers um, by two academics at Princeton. 
Now, if you look at Princeton's websites, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of PDFs of published Elsevier papers. So why did they only target those small number of papers and those, just those two researchers? So my, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect it's because they were testing the waters. You know, nothing's preventing, preventing Elsevier from doing a web crawl, finding all the published PDFs, issuing massive takedown notices to everybody who's violating their copyright agreement. But they don't do that. And I, they do that because I think they're trying to tread softly. They don't want to create a wave of anger that will completely remove the source of free labor that they depend on so critically. Now, as it happened, uh, I was grateful to Princeton for pushing back against them. And eventually, they rescinded the takedown notice. And so I think that they have a sort of taste of um, what it would mean to, to really go up against the, the body of scientists as a whole. Just the, the way that Elsevier thinks as an organisation is just antithetical to how um, I think a lot of academics think about what, what, it, what it is that they do. We sent freedom of information requests to every university in the UK. So in 2016, Elsevier received £42 million from UK universities. The next biggest publisher was Wiley, and that was at 19 million. Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, Taylor & Francis, and Sage, between them, they take about half of the money, and the rest is spread out. Elsevier in particular are a, a big, uh, big lobbyist in, in the European Union and in, in Washington as well. They employ a lot of staff that are basically full-time lobbyists. They have regular meetings with governments around the world in order to get across their point of view. There's some notion that publishers have that um, publishing has to be very expensive uh, and that publishing requires publicists and copy editors, PR agents, uh, managing editors, and so on. So many academic institutions, to cope with the burdensome costs, have elected to buy research journals in a big deal format as opposed to specific journal titles. Each institution, for the most part, negotiates, you know, with each publisher for access to, you know, generally that you know that publisher's entire corpus of research or a large portion of it, and what's called a big deal. So the subscription packages, which most libraries are involved in, because we can save more money, are definitely like cable subscriptions. You get a lot of content. You might not always like all the programming. But if you want to pay just for individual titles, the price goes up exponentially and you can't afford it. So we're stuck in contracts with content that we may or may not need to try to keep the price down. However, they can remove content from the package without notice. So if a publisher decides that they don't want a vendor to have a certain uh, piece of content in their package anymore, it can be removed immediately. That doesn't mean you can cancel the contract. That just means you no longer have access, and we have no control over that. Although most institutional access to current research operates like cable subscriptions, we found one library that has stood its tangible ground. What we had to find was a reason for us to be valuable to the research community. How could we add value to this proposition, even though we cannot support the rise in cost of electronic publications, and we realized that we could do that by remaining a print-based library. You can't have a plug pulled on tangible journals. No, we can't. We can't. And if the power fails, you know, we still have access to content by flashlight. You don't need a login or an, an institutional affiliation to use our library. Uh, we are open to the public. Even though we are privately funded, we are publicly available. You don't need a login. Anybody can access it. In the modern world, all of a sudden print-based seems pretty forward-leaning. Maybe half of our problem was getting roped into digital negotiations in the first place. So imagine a market for cable television where you don't know and you can't find out what your next door neighbor is paying for the same package that you have. How much are you paying for HBO? I can't tell you. I signed a non-disclosure with Comcast. Libraries, universities do that all the time. Commercial publishers can capture all of what's uh, called the consumer surplus. They don't need to pick a price point that maximizes their you know, revenue or profit across the entire market. They can negotiate that price point with every single institution. And that's important, right? Because it's like if uh, you know, you're buying healthcare and the doctor 
could look at your financials and be like, ah, well, if you want this treatment and you know they know you're a millionaire, then it costs you know five hundred thousand dollars. Whereas if you're a, you know somebody that doesn't have as much money, they can charge less but still make uh, a good return. I feel like in, in many ways that's sort of how the publishing market functions, right? The publishers can look at the endowment, how wealthy an institution is, how much they've paid over you know previous decades, um, and then charge right up to the level that they think is possible. There's a lot of choice in here for libraries. Uh, libraries don't have to sign those contracts. Um, and uh, public universities like University of Michigan have made a point of being much more transparent about what we pay for things. And the Big Ten Academic Alliance, of which we're part, uh, does a lot of uh, transparent work with each other. So I set off to test the Big Ten's transparency. Unfortunately, I was met with more of the same. I always sympathize with the librarians who, who um, rail against Elsevier, but my response always to them is, cancel. You don't cancel. We can't cancel. You can cancel. But you have to make that choice. And nobody does, so they keep, they keep going strong. Yeah, and I think that just, um, you know, that's all the process of negotiation. It's a traditional um, type factor of, of collections work in libraries, and there's a lot of issues with that. But it's, um, it's part of a negotiation uh, type of thing. And I don't see that changing at all. Because Could a university like Rutgers tell somebody what they pay for? A, no, we no. wouldn't, no. Because you're contractually well, um, bound not to. Yeah, and I mean, it's a, this is the way it works. So again, it's not up to me to comment on that particular aspect, but it is the way it works. And um, it, it's the way it works with all publishers, not just the ones you hear about. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know what I could compare it to, but it's, it's how it works. Yeah. So um, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be a change in that anytime soon. You know, I understand why a library wants to get a competitive advantage or wants to demonstrate that they are getting um, an economic benefit, getting a larger group of uh, content. Um, and institutional libraries are very different from each other and some have to really demonstrate different sorts of value. But it is a choice. Libraries don't have to sign confidentiality clauses. Um, it's often done in return for a, 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 what looks like a competitive advantage in the short term but in the long term, it's not a competitive advantage. It reduces price transparency and increases the risk of paying more as well as potentially paying less. It's fractally secret, right? Everything's a trade secret at every level. Like how much this cost, who paid what, what the terms were, right? and that's on purpose. It prevents collective bargaining, right? And all these things essentially maintain a really radically unfair market. There are some people who believe that there's enough money right now in scholarly publishing that it just has to be moved around. We don't need to find more money. Um, we just need to change the way it's in the system. There has been a growing collective of journals that find it advantageous to flip away from the for-profit paradigm. So in the case of, of Lingua Glossa, what happened is that that community of researchers decided that it was enough and then the editorial board all resigned and then started another journal on a non-for-profit platform, open access, etc. There's not that many cases of, of moves like that, but what this example shows is that it can indeed work. So the entire community, or the leaders of that community, because that's basically what an editorial board uh, is, the leaders of that community decided to resign collectively. Everyone on the board resigned, and then started a new journal with exactly the same focus, and in a way, the exact same quality, because what gives the quality of a journal, it's not the imprint of the publishers, it's actually the editor-in-chief and the ed editorial board who make, the, who make all of the scientific decisions. My name is Johan Roek, I'm a professor of French linguistics at Leiden University, and I uh, am also an editor of a uh, journal. Uh, first I was for 16 years the editor of uh, Lingua at Elsevier. In 2015 we decided to leave Elsevier and uh, to found uh, an open access journal uh, called Glossa, basically just the Greek translation of the Latin name to show the continuity. Uh, so the organization of Lingua was like we had uh, uh, five editors total, so a, a small editorial team, four associate editors, me as the executive editor, and then we had an editorial board of about 30 people. I had prepared all of this two years ahead of time, so I mean Elsevier knew nothing until we, un uh, until we flipped. So for two years, between 2013 and 2015, I had already talked to a number of people on the editorial board, but of course everything under, under, under the radar. 
And I had already talked to all the members of my editorial team to say, look, I am busy preparing this. If we do this, are you with me or are you not with me? Because I have to know. Because we all do this together or we don't. And so I all looked them in the eye <laughs> and they all said, yes, if, if you manage to do this, we do it. Elsevier's editorial body at Lingua, shifting to the open access equivalent Glossa, set a precedent of how a successful and respected journal could change its business model and yet maintain field-specific credibility, quality peer review, and overall impact. We live in a culture that really prioritizes startups and innovation and entrepreneurship. And the reality is that, that right now there is literally one company that can innovate on the scholarly literature, and it's Google. And that's, you know, Google's great. I use Google for everything, like most people, but I would kind of like it if there were a hundred companies competing for that. I would kind of like it if nonprofits could compete with them and, and try to create alternatives that said, you know what, maybe this shouldn't be a commercial product, it should be a utility. And that kind of competition isn't possible without open access. That kind of competition is baked into open access. And, and you, know, you see this from the large commercial publishers. You see them understanding that this is actually an important argument. And so they, let the little, they, they put like little drink straws in. That you, you dribble out little bits of content that you can do text mining on. We can make cars that can drive. You're telling me we can't process the literature better? If a car can drive itself because of the computational powers we have available, and there are, there are more companies competing to make self-driving cars than there are to process the biomedical literature and help us decide what drug to take. And that is a direct consequence of the lockup of the literature. That's a fundamental fucking problem. We started advocating in Congress for taxpayer access to taxpayer-funded research outputs. The most common response we got in our initial office visits was, you mean the public doesn't already have access to this? Like, there was a disbelief among policymakers that this was, to them, the words no-brainer comes to mind. Researchers want their work to be read. They want to advance discovery and innovation. Um, and while I spend a lot of time fighting over why work should be open versus closed, at the end, the real case is, do we want innovation or do we not want innovation? And I think there is an obvious case for openness to unlock innovation. We're, we're seeing a lot of very inventive resistance to this from some of the incumbent publishers. But I think there's also a generational factor here. I think the, the younger generation of scientists, of students, of academics, just it, the old model doesn't make sense anymore. The public should be ashamed for allowing a model like that to exist. Uh, we have today a set of tools to share knowledge, including academic research, in a way that we couldn't 20 years ago. You know, I've seen in our engagement with the, the academic sector, and by that I'm referring specifically to our grantees, so we make grants to academic institutions, and it's then the academics that work there that do the work. There's a, a much stronger appreciation for the role of open access to the results of their research. You know, they, they see it as being something that is a benefit to them as researchers to be able to have access to information, data, and so forth that's being generated by others. And so there's much more comfort with this notion of, of information and data being open and accessible. I'm never sure of the right solution, actually. When I talk to publishers, I think, can I, can I do this or can't I do this, you know? There are so many questions about, about copyright, there are so many questions about intellectual property, there are so many questions about what individual authors can and can't do if they decide to go and publish with a particular journal. It just feels like, a, it ju it just feels like there's so many questions with each interaction. One outlet that has streamlined scholarship is that of Sci-Hub which continues to connect individuals directly with the scholarship they need, when they need it, for free. You know, those of us who work in scholarly communications, writ large, right, um, really have to look at Sci-Hub as sort of a poke in the side that says, do better. We need to, to look to Sci-Hub and say, what is it that we could be doing differently about the infrastructure that we've developed 
to distribute journal articles, to distribute scholarship, because Sci-Hub cracked the code, right? And they did it fairly easily. And I think that we need to look at what's happening with Sci-Hub, how it evolved, who's using it, who's accessing it, and let it be a lesson to us for what we should be doing differently. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Александр Елбакян, ну я создатель проекта Сайхаб. Так, ну я считаю, что такие определения, как тычок под ребра, или вот как некоторые говорят, симптом того, что что-то, что что-то неправильно, это сильно умаляет значение Сайхаба. До Сайхаб большинство научных статей, это десятки миллионов, они были в закрытом доступе. А Сайхаб предоставил доступ к этому огромному массиву знаний, сделав его открытым. Ну, и Сайхаб это стал первым проектом, который предоставил вот публичный и массовый доступ к научным первоисточникам. People use um, websites like Sci-Hub, considered the pirate of um, academic publishing. It's, it's like the Napster of academic publishing. Um, I know they've been in legal battles with Elsevier who shut them down. They just opened up under a different website. It's still up and running and more popular than ever. So if I had to give advice to graduate students or people not affiliated with uh, institutions that provide access to a lot of these journals, Sci-Hub is a great resource. It provides it for free. A lot of people don't feel guilty about using these resources, just like when Napster came out, because the industry at present is making too much off of the people who are giving of themselves, uh, doing great research, and they're being taken advantage of. So to take advantage of publishers and get articles for free that are actually being used to educate or to develop uh, things that are used for the public good, it's, it's a trade-off that a lot of people are willing to make. And I'm not completely against it. Ну вот, за 2017 год было около 150 миллионов скачиваний научных статей. Там лидером оказался Китай с 25 миллионами скачиваний. За ним Индия 13 миллионов скачиваний. Ну, дальше тут там вот, ну, там США, Бразилия, Иран, Франция, Китай, там у них по, ну, 4, там, от 4 до 10 миллионов скачиваний научных статей. You know, I like those acts of what I would consider civil disobedience. I think they're important. I think um, they're a moment when we can, should have open discussion around them. And I fear that the openness of the discussion is, there's no nuance at all. It's either, it's as we've heard, Sci-Hub equals evil, like it just has to. Sci-Hub basically is illegal. Uh, it is a totally criminal activity and why anybody thinks it's appropriate to take somebody else's intellectual property and just steal it basically, I, I, that bothers me. It's not only about people who don't have access, it's, it's even being used by people in institutions that have full access because it works in a very simple and efficient way. What, what Sci-Hub shows is the, the level of frustration amongst many academics about the number of times they encounter a paywall. Maximum, what I saw, is that some people are making pretensions to that Sci-Hub violates the law. So, it doesn't bother them not that someone is stealing scientific papers. Ну, а их беспокоит то, что имеет место вот это вот формальное нарушение закона, а, ну, а по мнению некоторых людей, закон нельзя нарушать в принципе, даже если он совершенно абсурден. Вот так. I, I just feel like we're in the middle, we're in this interstitial period and everyone wants it to be done. As opposed to just saying, you know what? None of us really has a clue what's going to happen in the next 15, 20 years. Um, all we know is that we're at the edge of falling off the cliff that music fell off of with Napster. That's what Sci-Hub shows me, right, is there would not be a demand for Sci-Hub if we, if we had been successful or if the publishing industry had been successful, right? Arguably, what we did was create the conditions, right, on both sides, us and the publishing industry, that led to this moment. And so, you know, now that you see the potential of a system that lets you find any paper. I've been using Sci-Hub to collect my dad's papers. Right? My dad died earlier this year. Uh, he was a Nobel laureate for his work in climate change. I'm trying to build an archive of all his papers so I can give it to my son. Right? Can't do it. Price would be in the tens of thousands of dollars. Right? I'm not the only person who needs papers. I'm not the only person who's doing it this way. 
uh, I'm not trying to redistribute these things, right? I'm literally printing them out into a book, right? I'm just staple, I'm gonna staple it for my son, right? So he knows his granddad and what his granddad did because he won't remember it. That's a market failure. That's a tremendous market failure. Priorities are going to change. And I believe that Elsevier is a business full of smart people who want discovery to happen, but don't have a better idea on how to make money in the middle. And unfortunately for them, the internet is the story of breaking down gatekeepers. And they're the gatekeeper standing between, in some cases, research and discovery. Ну, Эльзевир, он всегда, это всегда было самое популярное издательство на Сайхабе. То есть большинство статей, вот, которые скачивали пользователи, они были с Эльзевировского сайта Science Direct. Mm -hmm. вот. Ну, что касается самой компании, то вот мне очень нравится их девиз «Making uncommon knowledge common». То есть, как бы, Но, как мне кажется, Эльзевир он не очень хорошо справляется с этой работой, а Сайхап им помогает, получается, реализовать вот их миссию. If someone's research is behind a paywall and it stops me from doing research in that field in my lifetime, how many more lifetimes do we have to wait for somebody else to be able to take that evolutionary step? Sometimes innovation is the right person in the right place at the right time. And all a paywall does is ensure that it's a lot less likely that the right person is going to be in the right place at the right time to get something done. Every kid learns you gotta share what you have. If I give what I got, you will give right back. We make things together better than we make them alone And when we create, we collectively own, yeah What we create, we collectively own But somewhere along the line In pursuit of money, of profit so high Businesses took a public good and locked it away hey. Behind a paywall Mountains of data And it belongs to you and me By all rights it should be free If I copy your files We want to solve problems Want to know what works In the name of science Progress and research In the name of science Progress and research But somewhere along the line In pursuit of money and profit so high Business took a public good and locked it away Behind a paywall, mountains of day 